Previously on The Secret Sits, we took you through the details surrounding the murder of real estate agent Mike Emmert, and in that, we discussed several of the possible suspects. Investigators have just gotten a hit on DNA associated with this case, and hopefully now we can put all of the puzzle pieces together. And that's where we find ourselves while we pick up our story today. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. Now, if you remember back to episode one of this story covering the mysterious death of Mike Emmert, I told you about a would-be home invasion at the Lake Washington home of Dr. Craig McAllister. This had taken place on March 26, 2010. Dr. Craig McAllister and his 20-year-old son Ryan, who was at home visiting his parents from college, pulled up to the McAllister's home, a beautiful home sitting on the majestic Lake Washington. Dr. McAllister was an orthopedic surgeon who had done very well for his family. As they approached the house, Dr. McAllister parallel parked out on the street. Earlier that day, they had received a large delivery of pine bark mulch, which was now piled in the driveway. Dr. McAllister and Ryan were joking and in great spirits as they walked the short distance from the street to the home's front door. But just as the two men were approaching the large mulch pile in the home's driveway, a masked man rose from behind the pile in the driveway. The man spoke in a relaxed voice, and he told the two men to just relax. The shadowy figure said that he had a gun, but if they cooperated, no one would get hurt. Craig McAllister stood still, taking in everything about the situation happening around him. Who was this man in the driveway? If this had been a normal break-in, when two adult men showed up, an average burglar would have run away. But this man had not. Why? If this man is not running, it is because he wants what is inside of the house. But what was inside of the house? Craig McAllister's wife, Stacy, and their 13-year-old daughter, Lauren. That is what was inside of the house. And Craig was going to do everything in his power to make sure that these men never reached them. Craig McAllister sprang into action lunging at the dark figure and tackling the man to the ground. This would-be home invader began to shock Craig over and over with a stun gun. But still Craig was prevailing in the fight. At one point during their tussle, Craig ripped the black ski mask from the man's face. Ryan bolted for a neighbor's house. He knew he needed to call 911 as his father was attempting to subdue this burglar. Just as Craig began to gain control over the man, an additional man in a black mask appeared from around the side of the house. Craig was made aware of this man's presence as he pistol-whipped Craig from behind. Craig collapsed to the ground. Blood ran from behind his left ear. The two men left Craig where he lay in the driveway, and they rushed to the home's front door. They began furiously kicking and pounding on the door, trying to gain entry into the house. Craig's wife, Stacy, was inside of the house and she heard the commotion outside in the driveway. She knew that her husband and son were due home any moment, so she decided to walk to the front door to see what all of the fuss was about. As she reached the door, she opened it, and there, standing in front of her, were two men, one donning a black ski mask. This sight took Stacy by surprise, and she screamed 
and slammed the front door closed, locking it instantly. The men did not even have time to react before the door was already reclosed in their faces. Stacy then turned and ran. She grabbed the home phone and called 911. The surgeon had fought back and protected his home and family, and the two men had escaped into the dark of night. But before the two men ran away, Dr. McAllister had torn one of the men's masks from his face, and in that mask, there was DNA. In episode one, we talked about Jeffrey John Solo, father of world-famous soccer star Hope Solo. He was the first suspect in the murder case of Mike Emmert. Well, this was not Jeffrey's DNA. In episode two, we talked about Gary Kruger and all of his bad deeds. This was also not Gary Kruger's DNA. When the DNA from the ski mask came back, it was a match to a man named John Allen Bradshaw. When police looked up John Allen Bradshaw, they learned that he was now 65 years old and he had held convictions for arson and money laundering. Not truly violent crimes, nor were they crimes similar to home invasions. John had served his sentence from 2001 through 2008. After he left prison, he moved into a home that was owned by one Mr. Gary Kruger. Yes, we have a connection. In the weeks following the botched home invasion, police could not locate John Allen Bradshaw, and they could not find Gary Kruger either. Actually, no one could find either of these men. Gary's wife, Betty, actually files a missing persons report in the midst of the police searching for him anyway. In Betty's report, she told the police that Gary was out of work and desperate for money. This little clue led the police to believe that Gary and John Allen had been working together to pull off a home robbery. But the target still did not make any sense. Why would these men rob one house instead of a bank? or a store that would have a guaranteed haul. That question would swirl around the police department for quite a while as the cold case grew colder and colder. The next piece of the puzzle did not reveal itself for another six months. Six months after the failed home invasion at the McAllister home in September of 2010, a body was found floating in the waters of Lake Washington. This body belonged to none other than Gary Kruger. The next day, Betty Kruger was filing for bankruptcy protection. Close to where Gary Kruger's body had been found, there was a nine-foot skiff, which had been stolen from the McAllister's home on the night of that ill-fated home invasion. The boat looked like it had capsized and it now lay on the ground below the water. Lake Washington, now its watery grave. Inside of the boat was a duffel bag containing hand restraints, duct tape, and ammunition matching the weapons carried by the two home invaders, as described by Dr. Craig McAllister and his adult son, Ryan. This new evidence made it seem even more like this was supposed to be much more than a simple home robbery. This evidence spoke of a much more malicious crime. As the investigation continued, police attempted to make any connections between the McAllister family and either Gary Kruger or John Allen Bradshaw. But anything they found was circumstantial at best. Even with Gary now deceased, the police continued on in their investigation. They did not know if John Allen was still alive, and if he was, he needed to be brought to justice. Dr. McAllister stated, We're functioning as if John Allen Bradshaw is alive, and he's coming back. It's just safer to function that way than to let our guard down. The next big break came when police discovered the van Gary and John Allen had been driving on the night of this crime. The van was left parked at a strip mall just a mile from the McAllister's home. The issue came with the fact that this van was still there. 
We know why Gary had not returned to the van. But why had John Allen not returned? When the King County Sheriff's Office was asked if they believed John Allen Bradshaw was still alive, the spokesman said this, Of course, it's possible. But when they went in the water in March in the middle of the night, you'd have to be a pretty good swimmer. Nothing much happened around this case for a very long time, and the King County Sheriff's Department did not talk about the case much more until 2016, when they finally decided they had a conclusion to the mystery surrounding the case. Why the McAllisters? Why rob them? In a press conference, Detective Scott Tompkins of the King County Sheriff's Department stated, The motive was that the doctor would not do Betty's knee replacement surgery. So there you have it. The long-awaited mystery is finally over. Two men had attempted to break into a family's home and do God only knows what to this family because the doctor would not do Gary's wife's knee surgery. Oh, and it gets even better. Dr. McAllister would not do the surgery because the Krugers could not afford it. But Dr. McAllister is a nice guy, and he even offered to perform the surgery if the Krugers could pay on a payment plan. But Gary refused. He wanted Dr. McAllister to perform the surgery for free which was never going to happen. Come on, Gary, where do you live? Nothing is free in the United States. In Gary Kruger's final criminal act, at least he was doing something stupid in an attempt to take care of a person he truly loved. It had been a year since Gary Kruger's body was discovered afloat in Lake Washington when Mary Beth Emmert received the phone call telling her that they had a match to the DNA of her husband's killer. But that information was not truly as it seemed. Mary Beth listened as it was explained that the DNA match was paired to forensic evidence found inside of Mike's black Cadillac Escalade. The DNA of her husband's killer had been in CODIS since 2001, but the DNA that it matched to had been sitting on a shelf for years. The DNA of Gary Kruger. Remember how Gary's DNA was not taken for years after he was paroled? And then the FBI's backlog caused the sample to not be uploaded for another four years? So now, as Mary Beth Emmert is sitting on the phone with the police, and they are telling her that they located her husband's killer, the suspected killer has already been dead for a year and a half. Now, because Gary Kruger is dead, they may never know why Gary's DNA was found in Mike's SUV or why Mike Emmert was murdered in the first place. Because Mike Emmert was a real estate agent and Gary Kruger had that short stint as a real estate agent, police began to investigate that as a lead. But after all of their investigations, police could never find anything that linked Gary Kruger to Mike Emmert. During their investigation, detectives did find evidence that made them return to their early theory that Mike Emmert's murder had been a professional hit. There had been a string of murders during the 1980s, and Gary Kruger's name kept coming up closer and closer to these cases. In 1981, a former Seattle police officer named Terry Dolan was shot while standing outside of a gas station that he owned and operated. Terry died from his wounds, and police initially thought this was a robbery gone wrong. However, later, they changed their findings to say that this was a staged robbery by an unknown killer. Gary Kruger was suspected of being involved in this crime, but there was never enough evidence to arrest him. 
In 1984, Jim Barry was working late in his office in Bellevue. Jim was an attorney, and he was preparing for an appointment with a client. Before this client arrived, an unknown assailant entered the office and stabbed Jim over and over. The attacker then left, and Jim Barry slowly bled to death on his office floor, left to be found by his anticipated client. Jim Barry had been representing a bank, which was pursuing collections against Gary Kruger for delinquent payments on a large loan. In 1985, Mario Vaccarino, president of the Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union Local 8, was found dead in a bathtub. In almost an identical scenario to the murder of Mike Emmert, Mario had been savagely beaten to death and then drugged to a bathtub. Mario's body was then sprinkled with a nice serving of Parmesan cheese. This is supposed to be some kind of warning in the mob, but I could not find anything to tell me what it means. If you know what kind of warning the mob is sending by sprinkling Parmesan on a dead body, tweet me. Once again, Gary Kruger's name was involved in this case. Gary's good friend, Joe Massimino Sr., worked for the union and the two went all the way back to their time in Vietnam. Word is that Joe worked for Mario, and Joe was scared he was going to get fired. Conveniently, though, after Mario was killed, Joe took his place and became president of the union. It's nice how things work out sometimes. After Gary's body was located, police went to question Betty about Gary's potential criminal involvement. When the investigators broached the subject of Mario's death, Betty looked the men straight in their faces, and she told them, of course he did. Gary had killed union boss Mario Vaccarino. Investigators do believe that Gary Kruger was involved or perpetrated all three of the murders I have mentioned, Terry Dolan, Jim Barry, and Mario Vaccarino. There has never been enough evidence against Gary for these crimes, and he is gone now anyway. So why does this matter? Well, Gary did have extremely loose connections to these men, as I explained. But police truly believed that Gary had murdered all of these men as a professional hitman. Chris Halsney, an investigative journalist who covered Gary Kruger's history for the Seattle-area TV station KIRO stated this about Gary Kruger. Write up a terrible, evil character, a serial killer, a man with no soul, and think it's fiction, but you're really writing about Gary Kruger. And along with these three murders from the 1980s, Gary is also suspected of killing Mike Emmert, in 2001. Because of Gary's violent past, his criminal record, and his DNA being inexplicably found in Mike's SUV, he was the only suspect in the case. The question remained, why? This could only be answered by the police's theory. Gary was a professional hitman. It has been over a decade since police discovered the evidence that tied Gary Kruger to Mike Emmert's murder. But they are still no closer to answering the question, why? Mike was a successful real estate agent. He was well-liked and had a promising career ahead of him. If what the police theorized is true, and Gary Kruger was a killer for hire, now Gary is dead. But the person who hired him to murder Mike Emmert is still out there. And that person has escaped justice for over two decades. If you research this case, the case will begin with the mysterious murder of Mike Emmert. It might look like a case which is solved, but it is not. The police have built an elaborate story about a monster named Gary Kruger, 
and I can call him a monster. But Gary Kruger never stood trial for this crime, and no one has ever been held accountable for the murder of Mike Emmert. And as proof, I submit to you the King County Sheriff's spokesman in 2016 saying this, The case of Mike Emmert is an open, active case. Was Gary Kruger a killer for hire? Was he the sole perpetrator in the murder of Mike Emmert? We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. This is the end of our last episode covering the mysterious death of Mike Emmert. But I wanted to take a couple of extra moments and talk to you as a listener of The Secret Sits. You know, I started this podcast with my husband two years ago, during the height of a global pandemic. Probably, well, hopefully, the only global pandemic I will ever have the pleasure of living through. And we started this podcast because I have always had a passion for true crime stories. I listen to many other podcasts, and yes, most of them are true crime or true crime adjacent. But I also know when I need to branch out and listen to something that is not based purely in true crime. I am very excited about our next episode. Not only will it be our 100th episode of The Secret Sits, something to celebrate to be sure, it will also be the final episode of Season 2 of The Secret Sits. We cannot believe that we have made 100 episodes of this show, which has changed and evolved into something we are so very proud to present to you each week. But with the end of Season 2 comes a hiatus for The Secret Sits. Don't worry, we are definitely coming back to you with Season 3, of The Secret Sits, and we are already working on new stories told to you in interesting and beautiful ways. We will also be working on additional projects that will be premiering later this year. Do you love the stories in the Grimm's fairy tales? Well, pop in your earbuds and listen to Rumpelstiltskin while you take your dog out on a walk, or gently fall asleep to the tale of the fisherman and his wife. If the Grimm's fairy tales is not your cup of tea, then wait for the release of A Daughter of the Samurai by Etsu Inagaki Sugimoto, which tells the true and fascinating story of a real Japanese samurai's daughter, brought up in the strict traditions of feudal Japan, who was then sent to America to meet her future husband. An engrossing, haunting tale that gives us insight into an almost forgotten age. We will be releasing all new content outside of The Secret Sits that you will not want to miss. Keep an eye out on The Secret Sits social media for updates. Until then, we dance round in a ring and suppose, but The Secret Sits in the middle and knows. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Lay. <laughs>